4, 3, 2, 1 и действие. This is the story of a man who dared to look beyond the horizon, setting the stage for a legacy that would forever change the course of history. But what drove this man, once shrouded in secrecy, to push humanity beyond its limits? Join us in this story about one of the most important, if not the most important figure in space history. Discover what motivated him and what his legacy is today. The answer doesn't lie in the stars, but in the unbeatable human spirit. This is not just the story of space. This is the story of us. On the 12th of January, 1907, under the roof of a teacher of Russian literature, a future visionary was born. Sergei Pavlovich Korolev would go on to become a legendary name in space exploration. By 17, Sergei was not just a dreamer, but a designer, crafting his first glider. His journey from the classrooms of the Kiev Polytechnic Institute to the halls of Moscow's university marked a shift towards the seemingly impossible domain of rocket propulsion. Despite personal disruptions, including a heart-rending separation from his father, Sergei's determination only strengthened. His early membership in the Society of Aviation marked the beginning of a lifelong commitment to pushing the limitations of human achievement. Under the guidance of Andrei Tupolev, Sergei not only mastered the skies, but also began to question them. What lay beyond the reach of his aircraft? How could he manage to break through the barrier separating Earth and space? In 1931, Sergei's quest for answers led him to Friedrich Zander, and the formation of the Group for Investigation of Reactive Motion, better known as GERD, one of the earliest state-sponsored centers for rocket development in the USSR. Together, they pioneered the GERD-09 and GERD-10, which was the Soviets' first liquid-fueled rocket. The group was taken over by the military, as they became more interested in their work, and in 1933 became known as RNII, the official center for research and the development of missiles and rocket-powered gliders. Korolev was in charge of aerospace structures, while his colleague, Valentin Glushko, was responsible for propulsion systems. Together, they designed the RP-318, the first Soviet-piloted rocket-powered glider. Join us as we venture into the next chapter of Sergei Korolev's extraordinary journey, where we will discover that for Korolev, Every challenge is an opportunity to soar even higher. As the ashes of the Second World War settled, a new era began an era where the battlegrounds extended beyond the Earth's atmosphere. At the center of it all, Sergei Korolev, once a dreamer and now a resourceful engineer, faced a tough challenge. Can he rise to the occasion and prove himself a true visionary? November 1944 marked a pivotal moment for Korolev. Tasked with an impossible deadline, he proposed the Soviet answer to the German V-2 missile. He met the challenge, although his proposal had a range of only 75 kilometers, just one quarter of the V-2 rocket. On 8th of September 1945, Korolev was brought to Germany, along with many other experts, to recover the technology of the German V-2 rocket. In the ruins of war-torn Germany, Korolev still, a political prisoner in the eyes of his own country, delved into the remnants left by Operation Paperclip. His mission was to reverse engineer the V-2 rocket. Korolev's genius transformed the captured knowledge into the R-1, setting a precedent for innovation. His endeavors didn't stop there. The R-2 followed, doubling the V-2's range and introducing the separable warhead, a milestone in ballistic missile technology, and even the R-3, which had a range of 3,000 kilometers or 1,900 miles, and thus could target England. The journey from the R-1 to the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile, the R-7 Semyorka, was fraught with failures and setbacks. However, the fourth test of the R-7, 
completed on the 21st of August 1957, was finally able to deliver a dummy payload to the Kamchatka Peninsula, and so delivering a payload across continents, underscoring the Soviets' technological competence. The R-7 Semyorka was the world's first true intercontinental ballistic missile. The successful launch of the R-7 not only solidified his standing, but also paved the way for humanity's first steps into space. This success, cloaked in secrecy, would soon lead to a breakthrough that changed the course of history. As we stand on the brink of the space age, driven by the ingenuity of Sergei Korolev and his team, we are reminded of the endless potential of human curiosity and perseverance. Join us as we venture into the next chapter, where Korolev's dreams transcend the Earth's atmosphere, marking the beginning of human spaceflight. On the 26th of May 1954, six days after being tasked to lead the R-7 ballistic missile program, Korolev submitted a proposal to use the R-7 to launch a satellite into space, marking the beginning of an endeavor that would not only push the limits of human ingenuity, but also ignite the spark of the space race. On 30 January 1956, the USSR Council of Ministers officially approved the satellite project, soon following with the launch of Sputnik 1, on the 4th of October, 1957, the world stood still as Sputnik 1, a simple metal sphere no larger than a beach ball, pierced the sky's veil, celebrating the beginning of the space age. Its beep-beep signal was a triumph of Soviet engineering, and it shook the world. The Soviet government initially had a low-key response to the success of the launch. However, the international reaction was electrifying and tumultuous, which the Soviets later capitalized on. But it was the launch of Sputnik 2 that underscored the boundless ambitions and sacrifices of the space race. The new Sputnik 2 spacecraft had six times the mass of the Sputnik 1 and carried the dog Laika as a payload. The entire vehicle was designed from scratch within four weeks, with no time for testing or quality checks. It was successfully launched on the 3rd of November 1957, and Laika was placed in orbit. However, there was no mechanism to bring the dog back to Earth, and Laika died from heat exhaustion after five hours in space. As we ventured into the unknown, driven by dreams and rivalry, the space race asked us a fundamental question. What are we willing to risk in pursuit of the infinite? In the wake of Sputnik's historic journey, Sergei Korolev, the mastermind behind the Soviet space program, set his sights on a more audacious goal, the moon. Even before the Sputnik 1 launch, Korolev was interested in getting to the moon. He came up with the notion to modify the R-7 missile to carry a package to the moon. However, it was not until 1958 that this idea was approved. Despite initial setbacks, Korolev's vision led to groundbreaking achievements. Luna 1, escaping Earth's gravitational pull. Luna 2, touching the moon's surface. And Luna 3, revealing the far side of the moon for the first time in human history. The Luna missions were intended to make a successful soft landing on the moon, but Korolev was unable to see a success. Luna 4 and Luna 6 both missed. Luna 5, Luna 7, and Luna 8 all crashed on the moon. It was not until after Korolev's death that the Soviet Union successfully achieved a soft landing on the moon with Luna 9. The Luna missions laid the groundwork, but Korolev's eyes were set on a bolder mission, sending a human to space. Korolev's planning for the piloted mission began in 1958 with design studies for the future Vostok spacecraft. It was to hold a single passenger in a spacesuit and be fully automated. On the 12th of April 1961, the Vostok spacecraft would carry Yuri Gagarin into orbit, making him the first human in space and Earth orbit. Gagarin returned to Earth via a parachute after ejecting at an altitude of 7 kilometers or 23,000 feet. The U.S. answer came on the 12th of September 1962 with a direct challenge from President John F. Kennedy, 
who promised to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. For the final event, the race to the moon, Korolev's staff started to design the immense N-1 rocket in 1961, using the NK-15 liquid fuel rocket engine. He also was working on the design for the Soyuz spacecraft that was intended to carry crews to the moon. The Americans were planning a spacewalk with their Gemini program, and the Soviets decided once more to trump them again by performing a spacewalk on the second Voskhod launch. After rapidly adding an airlock, the Voskhod 2 was launched on 18th of March 1965, and Alexei Leonov performed the world's first spacewalk. Unexpectedly, Korolev died in January 1966, before he could see his various other plans brought to completion. Just two weeks after Korolev's death, Luna 9 landed on the moon. This was to be the last big Soviet first in space for a long time. On the 27th of June 1938, Korolev was arrested after being accused of a variety of charges. He was tortured in the Lubyanka prison to extract a confession. Three months before this incident, Korolev's colleague Valentin Glushko was arrested. To reduce his own charges, Glushko denounced Korolev, which led to Korolev's arrest and a sentence of 10 years of forced labor. In all, Korolev spent more than six years in various jails including four months in a gulag forced labor camp in Kolyma, in the far east of Siberia, where he spent several months in a gold mine. In late 1939, Korolev returned to Moscow. By that time, his sentence was reduced to eight years. Due to the intervention by his old mentor, Andrei Tupolev, who was also in prison, he was relocated to a prison for scientists and engineers in September 1940. These prisons were labor camps where scientists and engineers worked on projects assigned by the Communist Party leadership. Korolev was isolated from his family until June 27, 1944, when he was discharged by special government decree, along with Tupolev, Glushko, and others. However, the charges against him were not dropped until 1957. Korolev rarely talked about his experience in the Gulag and lived under constant fear of being executed for the military secrets he possessed. He later discovered that Glushko was one of his accusers, which likely caused the lifelong hostility between the two men. Reflecting on Sergei Korolev's incredible journey, we see a man whose vision and resilience not only pioneered humanity's path into space, but forever changed the course of history. After he died in 1966, his true identity was finally revealed, and he received the appropriate public recognition for being the driving force behind Soviet accomplishments in space exploration. Before his death, he was officially identified only as the chief designer to protect him from possible assassination attempts by the United States during the Cold War. Today, the Soyuz spacecraft and R-7 launcher, both creations of Korolev, continue to serve as the backbone of space exploration. The R-7 launcher remains until today the world's most reliable space launcher, proving the true genius of Korolev. Sergei Korolev's journey reminds us that behind every leap toward the unknown lies the need to explore, the courage to dream, and the persistence to not give up. Alongside Werner von Braun, he stands as a monumental figure in the history of the space race, each architecting the path humanity would take to the stars. If you'd like to learn more about Werner von Braun's life, be sure to check out our other video about him. Thank you for joining us on this extraordinary journey through the life of Sergei Korolev. May his story inspire each of us to reach for the stars, to face our challenges with courage, and to never cease in our quest for discovery. For in the vastness of space, we find not only the future of humanity, but the enduring spirit of exploration that defines us. 
Good night and keep watching the skies.